All right, let's go over to uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, please. Uh, we're going to talk about the indirect claims of Jesus. Now, we've already seen, they're on the, it's on the board there. Uh, we saw his self-centered teachings. That's where he said, I am, and, and, and those sort of things. And then his direct claims last week. Now, today, what we're going to look at are his indirect claims or the longer around the way claims, <laughs> you, you might call it, the roundabout claims that he's, he's going to uh, uh, make or already has made, and they're, they're recorded for us in the Scripture. So I'd like, just as a reminder, to read you uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, please. 2 Timothy chapter number 1, and let's notice verses 8 through 10 where it says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. And listen, folks, that's what we're doing all the time in life, aren't we? I mean, we're connected with our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it says in Christ. What does that mean? Anybody have any ideas? Well, what's it mean to be in Christ? I mean, we know we, we believed to bring us to that situation, but what's it actually mean to be in Christ? There you are, Richard. How simple. We're connected to our Lord Jesus Christ. And our whole lives, you know, Paul says, walk worthy of the calling, you know, et cetera, et cetera, as, as you see that. So we're connected not just with the Lord Jesus Christ, but with his testimony. And where do we find a testimony? Right here in, in the Word of God. So when Paul writes, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the sufferings for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. Now, that's a wonderful thing to, to get your hands around, okay, and your mind around. Because of his purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death. I'd like to just stop and talk about that for about 10 days. Who abolished death. Do you believe it? Really? And why do we get so concerned about it when someone dies? It's been abolished. So what we have to do is learn what death he's talking about. All right? The sin death. And by the way, we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. Be, be, be with us about the spirit and flesh. All right? And we'll have a good time with that. But watch what he says. Let me finish verse 10. And which now has been manifest through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through what? Through the gospel. Okay, through the gospel, through the cross work of our Lord Jesus Christ, his, bur his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and all that it entails. And that's why we have the book in front of us. And that's why we should indeed never be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Okay, uh, and nor, in fact, of Paul. All right, as it says up there in verse number eight, as we look at it. So what I'd like to do then this morning is some of the claims that Jesus made, and I call them indirect claims. All right, uh, let's go back to Mark chapter two for the first one here. I have four of them, if I can get through them all this morning, that we'll look at. But in Mark chapter two, let's pick it up in verse number one, and we'll read from one down through 12. Mark chapter number uh, two, one through 12, okay? Now it says here, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So where was the Lord's home? At Capernaum. The Lord had a house in Capernaum. Remember, he was a carpenter. He worked for a living. So he had this house in Capernaum. Capernaum. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Now, uh, put yourself in a situation here. You're in a house. 
that's loaded with people where Jesus is. No more room in there, not even at, door, at the door, meaning there were so many people standing outside that you couldn't get in if you wanted to. Can you all picture this now? Okay. That's very important that you do this. <laughs> and, verse 3, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So here's four men carrying somebody that's a paralytic, meaning he can't walk, or there's something wrong there. He's paralyzed in some, some sort of way, right? And when they could not get near him, why couldn't they get near him? Okay, because of all the people who are in the house and outside the house, they couldn't get near him, see? And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, now, now watch what it says. They removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, Rose Hawkins, what if somebody removes the ceiling above where you're sitting? What would happen to you? You'd get cold. Today, you'd be rained on. But what about the parts of the ceiling? You know, the houses back in those days were flat roofed. And I did my study on this, okay? And they are either packed with mud, with, uh, we'd say sticks and, and that sort of things. And a lot of time, it, it was wheat and, and different grains like that. They, they'd take the old stalks, put them together, and they'd mix them with clay or mud, you see? And they, they, they'd dry them and pack them, and that's what they use for their roof, all right? This just wasn't, uh, you know sticks of wood up there because they couldn't stand on that. They'd all fall through. But here's what I want you to remember now. No, no remember, picture it. Start getting your mind in tune with what the Bible shows us here. And you're allowed to have an imagination, by the way. So here's these four men. I wonder if they, they got, you know, they said, man, we got to go through the roof. That's the only way we're going to go. And one of them went over to, uh, to the uh, little shed Jesus had where he had his, all, all his tools probably got an axe or a hatchet, maybe a shovel or two, and they went up to the roof. Well, they had to get a ladder, go up to the roof. They got the man up there, and what did they have to do? They had to dig a hole in the roof. Well, what about the people that are at the bottom of that? Stuff's falling down on them and all, all this sort of thing, and you can say, what's going on up there? All right? So for the people inside, it wasn't a pleasant experience, all right? But what happened there as you read it? They let down, the end of verse 4, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now you gotta, they let it down. Did they put it down vertically, tie the man in vertically, or did they have him horizontal and on each end letting that was horizontal? That was a mighty big hole in the Lord's, I wonder if his insurance is going to cover that hole. No, we don't think of these things, do we? Okay? Be practical. But watch what happened. Now notice the words of Jesus. He doesn't rebuke them for destroying his roof. He says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Now notice, why do you question things where? That's where everything begins. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. How did he get out? The place is packed with people. They had to make a way for him. And he's walking in between these people. And what's, the, what's it say here in this verse? And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. So that they were all amazed. He's walking by. Maybe they're high-fiving him. I don't know. As you, as you look at this. Okay? But they're all amazed, it says, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. 
What did they see? They saw a man get healed that was on a bed, that was let down through the roof, right? But what's the first thing the Lord said to him? Then thy sins are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven. Now, what's it mean to forgive? Forgive is actually a legal term. It's to express the discharge or the acquittal of a defendant when the guilty person is dealt with as innocent. So no matter what he did, the Lord did what? You're forgiven. You see it there, verse 5, verse 7, verse 9. The first statement, and you know my thought, thought that went through my mind? They lowered this gentleman into the room in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, not to get his sins forgiven, but to get him healed. But yet the Lord says, first of all, your sins are forgiven. That's the wonderment. Now, let me ask you this. I won't ask you. Let's just turn there. Come back to Genesis 50 with me. Let's see the first time the word forgive or forgiven is used in Scripture. And you'll have to come all the way back to Genesis chapter 50. This is quite a few years after Adam and Eve, isn't it? Well, watch what it says here. This is a great story as you read it. And I'm taking my time here, so don't get excited. But verse number 7 we're in a situation with uh, Joseph where Jacob has died. And, and, and uh, Joseph goes to the Pharaoh and gets permission. Now remember, he's the second in command of the whole, the whole country here of, of Egypt. So he's asking for permission to go bury his father back in the homeland, right? Verse 7, so Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So we have quite a caravan going up. As well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, his father's household, only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atta, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. Now we're talking about Joseph here. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atta, they said, this is grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizram, it is beyond the Jordan. The meaning of that name is mourning. Okay, they were mourning as we see that. Now, notice verse 12. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. He requested and commanded that he be taken home. All right, he wanted to be buried with his dear wife, Sarah. Verse 13, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham brought, bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess a burying place. And he had buried his father, Joseph. After, I'm sorry, after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Now, this is a very interesting story, and we're going to move into the forgiveness thing here in a minute. But notice this. They got to beyond the Jordan, that little town, and they stayed there seven days and mourned for their father. Then they took him up where the grave site was that his father bought from Hebron. Okay, so to me, that, that's very interesting. Now it's all over where they do. They go back. They return to Egypt, right? Now, let's pick it up in verse number 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us 
and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Remember the evil? They dug a ditch, threw him in, sold him into slavery, they thought, right? And all the things that he went through there in, in Egypt. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, this is, it. this is interesting to me, and I circled it. Your father gave this command before he died. I wonder why they didn't say, our father gave this command before he died. Now think about it. Something's going on here. They're still living as if there's a divided family here. Right? And here's what the command was. And I don't read this anywhere else, so I'm, I'm taking for granted that Jacob did say this, but I don't know. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of your God, of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in, am I in the place of God? That's a question. Am I in the place of God to forgive you? All right. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it to good or for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, Joseph says, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now you would read this and say, oh, they must be relieved. Well, my question is this. Come back to chapter 45 with me. Chapter 45. Okay, let's come back to the situation where <laughs> the first time the boys came down, the men came down, the sons of Jacob, and there was Joseph, and, and they were brought into his room, and he did not reveal himself. Do you all remember that? And then he says, one of you is going to stay with me, and you go back and bring your father down. And they did that, see? That's what they did. So they come back a second time. Now watch 45 verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. This is going to be a very emotional time for Joseph. So he, he sent all the Egyptians out of the room, you see. And, when, and he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, exclamation point. Is my father still alive? But his, father, his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. So why would they think... Five chapters later, that their brother would turn against them when their brother said, this was of God. So what's it tell me about those sons that were left back in chapter 50? They had no relationship with God. They didn't understand Joseph. They had no faith at all. They were still concerned about their own flesh and their own cons we might say their skin, <laughs> all right? That's what they were concerned about. Joseph had already in his heart done what? Forgave them all the way back here in 45. And yet they were living wherever, you know, however long jo uh, uh, Jacob lived until he, he passed on. They were living with that guilt where in fact it says, that, man, Joseph says it was the work of God so people could be saved. They couldn't grab a hold of that thing. Say, go ahead and grab a hold of it. I think it's really sad to see that kind of situation. But when you're looking here, and let's come back to, uh, if you would, Mark chapter number two, please. So when we're looking here at the Lord Jesus Christ healing a man 
That's what people saw. Why did they see it? Because that's the only thing people want to see. They want to see the things of the flesh. Something they can touch. That's why I say, I mean, here's the guy walking through, and people are high fine him, saying, hey, congratulations, great, good job. Glad you can carry that bed instead of having to be laying on it. That's all men see, even believers today. That's all they see, okay? They don't see what the Lord is trying to accomplish, trying to teach. That's why I say this is an indirect statement or claim of our Lord Jesus Christ. His claim is that he has the authority now to forgive sins, but that didn't seem to rub off on the people. All right? Didn't seem to rub off on them. When you read verses 8, 9, and 10, let me read them one more time before we go on, okay? 8, 9, and 10, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Well, what things? Forgiveness. That's what they're, you know, questioning here. Forgiveness is what they're questioning, which is easier to say, the Lord says, to, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. What would be the easier thing? Forgive, your sins are forgiven, right? But then, then we look at it, and it says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, they say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God for this saying, we have never or we never saw anything like this. Never saw it. Okay? Nothing about the word of forgiveness that the man received. You know, the same, I believe it's the same story is found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 to 5. And uh, in there, what the Lord says, be of good cheer. Some Bibles say, be of great joy. For your sins are forgiven. He doesn't say be of great joy because you've been healed. No, but that your sins have been forgiven. And we should keep that in mind, all right? Keep it in mind. Now, let's go over to, where do we want to go? His next claim. His next claim was to give life. You know, and I'm not going to read this, but John chapter 6, verse 35, he said, I am the bread of life right? And he goes on with that about who he is. In John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the what? The life, you see? In John 11, verse 25, dealing with Mary and Martha, and the people are there for Lazarus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, we want to turn, though, to John chapter 15. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? He says to the folks, you have to love the Lord when, whenever he says, do you believe that? <laughs> the situations he's in. But we come over to John chapter, where did I have you go, 15? John 15 here. Let's notice, please. Uh, let's pick up in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does uh, bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. So what's he telling folks here, his disciples? I'm the vine. Where does the life of the branches come from? From the vine. All right? That's where it comes from, from the vine. And he is the vine, and there's no life apart from him. And if there's no life apart from him, then there's no fruit coming in either. Now, just think of that. You know, my neighbors uh, next door to us, they, they put up a, a small vineyard <laughs> a couple of number of years ago. Okay? And it's always a joy to see him out there working keeping it cleaned, keeping it pruned, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and you know why that is? Well, this is selfish on my part. 
<laughs> uh, they don't share with us the fruits of the vine. No, they, sh they share other things with us from their pear tree and, and things, things like that. But not, I think Tom makes his own wine is what he does. So, but that's all right. But you know what happens if you don't take care of a, a, a vine, you know, the grapes? Do you ever see those big old black spiders? Big, the black ones, they, they, get, they can get pretty big and they move pretty quickly. We never saw one of those until they put up the grapes. And what we learned, or what I learned from my neighbor, was this. If we don't keep it clean, those spiders come, and that's where they live. And then when we come to clean, what happens to them? Then they run. Where do they run to? Somebody else's house. See? That kind of thing. And so we appreciated them keeping it clean and, and that. But that's what the Lord is talking about here. He says, because the vine dresser is whom? It's his father. He keeps things clean. Why? So the life of Jesus Christ can continually go on within the, the, the life of the believers. Okay? It's, it's really simple when, when you look at it uh, in, in that sort of, uh, sort of light. But also then in John chapter 4, let's see where long as we're in John. Come on back to chapter 4 to one of our favorite ladies in the Scripture. Okay? Notice with me verse 10 through 15 here, all right, 10 through 15, where it says here, Jesus answered her, woman at the well, right, Samaritans, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? See the, the idea of the flesh right there, right? It's always the idea of the material with folks. But she has enough sense to ask, where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to what? Eonian life or eternal life. What's welling up inside you? As you sit here today, as you walk in your daily walk, what is it? It says it's a well, it's water welling up to what? Eonian life. Have you ever thought of it that way? It's growing within you. It's there. Just like a well gives water. We were talking to my son Joshua, and he's a, you have to know Joshua, he's a, uh, He's an expert on everything. You know, people like that, right? <laughs> it was kind of cute, though. He was talking about water, bottled water. And, and he, he can taste the difference between the waters. And, and some of the expensive waters he doesn't like. They have some kind of taste. What's the name of the water that comes from the volcano? Fiji water. It actually comes from a place, you know, uh, it's fed and it goes through the ground, through rocks that are part of a volcano. So it has a little bit of a different taste to it than regular water, you know. But, but I, always, I think those things are neat that people can perceive those things in life. How much of the, can people perceive of us of living water as we walk the face of this earth? The life of our Lord Jesus Christ supposed to be what? manifested in us. I mean, it's a wonderful privilege when you look at it. Uh, come back to Mark 10 with me, all right? Mark chapter 10, please. Well, this is just about the indirect claim that, that he can give life. He did it uh, directly. I think the, the verses are behind us, aren't they? Yes, they are. Okay. So let, let's go back to Mark, what I say? Chapter 10. And let's notice verses 17 through 21 here. 17 through 21, Mark 10, where it says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran, ran up and kneeled before him, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit Eonian life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good except God alone. I spoke with a lady, one of our dear ladies on the phone the other day, and, and she was out running errands for her neighbors. And they said, oh, you're so good. She said to him, no, there's only one that's good, and that's God. I'm not good because I complain the whole time I'm doing this. Which was, which was an honest thing, you know. But she had a, a you know, love in her heart that, to help her neighbors, okay? So, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. The correct thing is loving him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and do what? What was the problem here? He didn't have enough love in his heart to help other people, not like Jesus had for him. Okay? Because if he's going to follow Jesus, he's going to have to love. That love wasn't there. So that love wouldn't be able to manifest life to anybody else. It's sad. Notice John chapter 17. I'll read it to you. John 17, verses 2 and 3 say this. When Jesus, uh, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give Eonian life to all whom you have given him. And this is Eonian life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have what? Sent. And what are those who have Eonian life to do? Follow him. How does Paul put it? Twice he says it. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. All right? He, he says that. In other words, we're following Christ. He is the life giver. We want to share that with folks. All right? That's what it's all about. But there is a third indirect claim we're going to look at. All right? And this is his claim is to teach the truth. His claim is to teach the truth. But let me say this to you. It's not so much about what Jesus taught as, as dogma. But what attached his listeners, what <laughs> attracted his listeners was the impression that he gave concerning wisdom. Concerning wisdom. Uh, let's go back to Mark chapter 6 real quickly. Mark chapter 6. All right. Mark chapter 6, let's notice the first three verses. He went away from there and came to his hometown. Where's his hometown? Capernaum. Okay, good. And his disciples followed him. And on a Sabbath, he began to teach in a synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. What is the wisdom given to him? Now, to me, this is interesting. Uh, where would you go in the Old Testament to read about the wisdom of Jesus? Okay, uh, Richard says Proverbs. That's true. But how about a specific chapter? Does anybody remember? Think of it. Well, I'll think of it for you. Let's go to chapter 8. Let's go to chapter 8, please. Okay. Chapter 8. See if we can connect this somehow. Now, I have a... Uh, 
ESV here. It's an inductive uh, study Bible, and it does have references. But before every book, it gives you instructions on what you should do if you really want to understand, right? And so every chapter has a theme line, right? Then at the end of the book, it has a place for every chapter where you can write it and thoughts that you have, you know, to, to summarize them for yourself to help you to remember them. And I have in a theme line, Lady Wisdom, right? But notice verse 1, and let me read down through for a while. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the height beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gate in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries aloud. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of men. O simple ones, learn prudence. Oh, now, wait a minute. She's talking to men. My cry is to the children of man. That's to men. O men, at the beginning of verse 4. Then she says, O simple ones. So what's she saying about men? They're simple ones here, right? Learn prudence. Oh, fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Her wisdom. It's better to have wisdom than the riches. Then it says this. Now wisdom is speaking. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Who is she talking about or who is she? Wisdom. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the path of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me. Notice that word love is appearing. And filling their treasures. The Lord. Now here we go. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of men. And now, O oh sons, listen to me. I have written over here Matthew 5, 1 through 11. Sermon on the Mount, right? 
Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my door, for whoever finds me finds what? Life. And obtain favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. I wonder, I just wonder, I do a lot of wondering when it comes to the Scripture. I try to put myself where they are. And remember the two gentlemen, they were on the <laughs> way home, the road to Emmaus, and the Lord appeared to him. But then how, what did the Lord say to them? How, where did he teach them from? From the Old Testament. I wonder if he revealed to them in his teaching to them, and then to the disciples when he went back, and they went back, by the way, if he revealed to them, this is me. I was there before it all started. What's it say in the book of Revelation? I don't know the exact chapter, early on, about the Lord Jesus Christ and creation. What well, you know? Might use the word born. We'd have to go look it up, but look it up. They'll give you some homework. Firstborn of creation. Who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ, out from the very heart, mind of God. In Colossians 1. Thank you, ma'am. About the 15 on, yeah, that, that we see that. The Lord was there before it all started. He was there in the very heart and mind of his father. Yeah. Job also. Okay. Thank you, Richard. So we, we see all that. You see, but Brother Dan, what's that all have to do with? He is wisdom. Been around a while, a long while. Longer than this universe has been here. And you know what? Scribes and Pharisees couldn't handle it. Because all they could perceive, he wasn't learned. But they perceived the wisdom, question mark. He was a blasphemer to them. It's really sad. Last point I'll make, and I'll make this quick. All right. Let's, let's come over to John chapter 5, please. I'll just give you a summary of the last point. That has to do with his indirect claim is to judge the world, right? To judge the world. Let's come over to John chapter number 5. And let's notice, first of all, verse 22. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That's what he says. Notice verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of what? Judgment. He is going to judge. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me, the will of him who sent me. Now, I have other verses here. If you can see Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Okay? Now, these have to do with the end of the age, the end of the old covenant, that sort of thing. But there's much debate as to how, when, and where this is going to happen. But the whys... There is no question about. We better look at it. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, please. All right, Matthew 25. Let's look at 44, 45, and 46. All right, let's start in 44. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into Eonian, or age-abiding punishment, but the righteous into Eonian life. So the judgment here is based on what? You know, if you read the whole chapter, and we've read it so many times in the last year, uh, you know, the, the questions of when, where, and how always come up, but never the question of why. They didn't do it to those that needed help. 
during their lifetimes. We're talking about the Jews here during the lifetime of Jesus Christ. They didn't help the poor, you know, and other people just didn't do it. So if they didn't help them, they didn't do it to whom? To the Lord himself, because they didn't do it to the Lord himself, there's no reward there. Those who did it get what kind of life? It says it right there, eonian life. Those who did not go away, okay? They're going to have to learn some things. You can always see this, uh, also see it in Matthew chapter 30 or 10, verses 32 and 33, all right? And then chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Now, here's what I would ask you. I'll give you four little things here, right? Uh, Jesus, the forgiver, okay? The life giver, the one with wisdom, the judge here, okay? If you were the, in the audience that he was speaking to, what would you think of him as he claimed these things? What would you think of him? I mean, I think this would have been a hard thing. It wouldn't have been easy. Oh, they would lack faith. Well, it's easy for you to sit that has the whole book in front of you to say they lack faith. When we ourselves lack faith in not believing the Word of God in everything He's given, okay? But think about it. What kind of man was he? Well, next week we're going to look at the, uh, how's it say there? Oh, it's not on there. The miraculous. We're going to look at the signs that he did, the signs that he claimed. And what you're going to notice, and I'll just say it as, as a preview, nobody cared what they meant. All they wanted to see is, that sure is good wine. Thanks for healing my son. Thanks for raising my daughter. But what did it mean? And hopefully we can get to that place where we understand he did them for a purpose. And that purpose had nothing to do with the flesh. It has everything to do with the spirit and our relationship with our God. Okay? Who is he? That's the whole thing. God bless you. Thanks for listening today. I appreciate your attention.